Petromatad is focused on oil exploration, development and production in Mongolia. It holds a 100% working interest and the operatorship of the Matad Block 20 production sharing contract with the government of Mongolia, amongst other initiatives. I'm delighted to be joined by the chief executive, Mike Buck. So, Mike, we're almost at the end of 2024. Have you achieved what you set out to do at the beginning of the year? Hi, Sarah. Yeah, well, yes, uh, I would say we have. Um, it was a year of two halves. We spent the first five months struggling to overcome our land access problem that we'd had for some years. Uh, that did get fixed around about the middle of the year. And so from a standing start in June, I'm very pleased with the way the team responded. We were able to do the work program that we had raised money for in the middle of 2024. And that was uh, with a priority to complete the Heron 1 discovery well and get that on stream, to drill an appraisal development well at Heron 2 to give us um, two producers, if if possible, through the 2024-25 winter, and to drill a high impact exploration well called Gobi Bear 1. Um, And we were able to do all of that um, on time, on budget, without any HSE issues, but with a few mixed results. Okay, so let's talk about those results. You mentioned Heron 1 there. Can you provide a bit more detail on how the well is performing now it's in production? Yeah, sure. So we've been on stream with um, with Heron 1 now for pretty much exactly a month. Um, this is the deepest producing well in the basin, and the basin to the north of us has been long explored and produced in Block 19 by PetroChina. So as I say, we're the deepest producing well in the basin, and although we saw some indications when we tested the well back in 2019 that there was some uh, pressure behind the oil coming to surface, uh, and there was also some gas, which is unusual for this basin, and that has proven over the first month of production to be very much the case. We've been seeing a lot of enthusiasm for this well to produce um, quite high pressure at surface and a fair amount of associated gas, not, not, a, not a large amount by, by any means, by industry standards, but for this basin, quite a lot. Um, that has given us a bit of a problem because the pressure rating on the surface equipment did not anticipate these high pressures. And whilst it's nice to see a well that is enthusiastic to flow, as Heron 1 is, uh, we've had to choke it back to make sure we don't go out of the the safety tolerances of our our equipment. So we've been running for the month uh, between 200 and 300 barrels of oil per day. Um, We haven't had to use the pump that we have installed. Um, We are monitoring the well, obviously, very closely to see how... This pressure response continues, how long, how sustainable this gas production actually is, because that gives us an opportunity to um, be able to collect and use the gas, particularly for uh, fuel, which would save us on, on operating costs. So we're looking at that quite, um, um, quite diligently, and we will be doing so over the next few months. Right now, the winter is setting in. So production operations on Heron 1 will run through through the winter um, and that will give us some time to work out modifications to the, uh, the infrastructure that could potentially allow us to produce at higher rates if this well continues to show the enthusiasm that it currently has. And additionally, you are working hard to complete the cooperation agreement to allow you to sell the product from Heron One. How confident are you of getting this approved? Uh, I'd say we're very confident uh, and we're very much nearly there now. Um, We've been discussing this cooperation agreement with the regulator, MR PAM, and with the Block 19 operator for a very long time. Um, I think it took the catalyst of actually being ready to come on stream to kick everybody into action. So since we came on stream, um, we or, or immediately before, we were able to get Block 19 to agree to take the oil. So at least there would be somewhere to put it, that it would be processed and would be kept warm through the winter months. Uh, but we said um, at the outset, you know, we, we don't, we're not 
interested in just producing this stuff to store it. It's quite nicely stored at the moment underground. What we want to do is bring it out and sell it. The commercial terms of the agreement are now completely agreed between ourselves and the Block 19 operator. They are now under review by uh, the Mongolian regulator. Once again, we are breaking ground here. This is the first time that third-party business is being done by one producer through the facilities operated by another. Um, and although this is standard industry practice around the world, this is the first time it's been done in Mongolia. So the regulator has got a few questions, um, wants to make a few changes, actually not to the terms that we've agreed with Block 19, but actually some that are specific to their share of production. I'm pretty confident that we will have a resolution of that in the very near future. And once we have the signed agreement, we are then able, and only then, to apply for the customs permit that would allow the oil to be transported into China. Um, that is something that uh, Block 19 does on a regular basis for its own production. So it is uh, a very well understood process to get the customs permitting done. Uh, but you need the signed agreement before you can start. Uh, so as soon as we've got that signed agreement, we will do that. And then we are hoping to be able to uh, get the oil uh, to market as quickly as possible and start generating some revenue. And Petra Matad is very much looking forward to sharing with, um, with shareholders the details of how that is going to work and what kind of net back we can expect per barrel once it's underway. But Mike, shareholders also want to know about the other well, Heron 2. Uh, it's being suspended and the stimulation and pressure data uh, is going to be reviewed to determine the forward programme. So what are your plans for the well now? Okay, so Heron 2 uh, was drilled um, a, just short of a kilometre away from Heron 1. We, we kept it close to the discovery well because we were hoping to see the same reservoir and the same production performance that we saw at Heron 1. And we also, as I said, wanted to have uh, the, the, uh, the advantage of two wells on stream through the winter if that was at all possible. The drilling and log response from the well, from Heron 2, it was very similar to what we saw in Heron 1, and that gave us some, um, some hopes that we would get a similar test result. But unfortunately, the test result was not the same. We, um, we found very, very low flow. We had to do an operation called swabbing for quite a long time to be able to see what fluid was actually in the reservoir. And the reservoir is behaving like a very tight, low permeability reservoir, which obviously Heron 1 is not. So there's a little bit of an inconsistency between what we saw when drilling and logging compared to what we've been able to get out of the well on test. And that's why we are um, now looking at the pressure data that we recovered when we were able to recover the gauges from, from down the hole, looking at the data we got when we stimulated the well to see if anything's gone wrong with the operation, because I want to know whether what we're seeing now by way of flow rate is actually an indication of what the reservoir will do, or is there something that was done during the testing uh, that could have caused this, uh, what looked like a similar reservoir to Heron 1, to perform as poorly as it did. We were able to get oil out of the well, um, which was uh, in some way encouraging, but the rate that the well seemed to be able to do, under swabbing anyway, was probably about 30 barrels a day. We did consider whether we could just kind of keep the well going through the winter, but because of the fuel needs, particularly in the winter months, to keep the, um, the oil warm, uh, 30 barrels a day is probably marginally commercial as a winter producer. So we're going to analyze all that data and decide what to do with, with Heron 2, which could be uh, uh, you know, a reperforation, a recompletion, a clean out, uh, or potentially just suck it and see once we get into the um, a warmer weather of, the, of, uh, of spring and summer. Uh, so yeah, it's a little bit of a puzzle at the moment as to why we saw a reservoir that looked similar to Heron 1 but did not perform the same way. Uh, so we're going to be working on that over the next few months. 
So let's talk about diversification now, because in February of last year, you established a joint venture company, Sunstep Renewable Energy, and that was to compete in the country's growing renewable sector. So how have projects or ideas progressed in in the second half of this year where that joint venture is considered? It's been going pretty well, actually. Uh, and one um, major positive for Sunstep is with the, uh, with the new government coming into power in late June of 2024, the new government is very much focused on energy independence and particularly on the renewable sector. So there have been a few conferences already held, including an economic forum in Singapore that Sunstep uh, attended, where the Deputy Prime Minister has been pushing foreign investment in the energy sector in Mongolia and in particular in renewable energy. So timing is pretty good. Um, when we set the joint venture up, we quite quickly got two projects high graded. One, a 50 megawatt battery storage project where the permitting is is ongoing. And I hope to say be able to say a little bit more about that maybe before the end of the year or perhaps early in, in 2025. And we also have a green hydrogen project with um, uh, Oyu Tolgoi, the big copper mine that is being um, uh, developed in, in Mongolia. Um, we've submitted to OT a detailed technical um, and commercial feasibility study for that project. Uh, they are reviewing that, and we're hoping to get back together with them to start discussing uh, the time frame for actually executing the pro project and the um, uh, contractual structure for that as well. So as soon as we're able to say more about that, we will. Um, this new enthusiasm for renewable energy in, in Mongolia um, is generating quite a few projects uh, and, and quite a lot of those are coming our way. We are being offered um, opportunities to cooperate with others, uh, Mongolian and international, on projects from relatively small, just a few tens of megawatts, to massive 1.5 gigawatt projects. Um, obviously, when you get to the build stage, these, these projects can be um, highly capital intensive. But at the development stage, which is currently Sunstep's absolute forte, uh, we see advantages to being nimble and being present um, at the moment. And yes, I'm hoping we're going to be able to increase the portfolio with two or possibly two or three more projects in the near future. And obviously, as soon as we've got any of those um, uh, at an at a, um, exclusive stage, then, uh, then we would be um, uh, very, very happy to share that news. Okay, so let's look to the future now. I'm speaking to you at the end of November 2024, winter setting in. So what is the focus for the remainder of this year and going into early 2025? Well, as I think everybody knows, in the, in the oil sector in Mongolia, there's always an operational hiatus um, that starts around about now and lasts sometime into March or April, depending on people's work programs for the following year. So that means that um, you know, drilling operations um, are suspended and crews go home, generally to, to China. But the one thing that does go on that we've not been able to enjoy before is oil production. So our oil production will continue through the winter months. We're getting our uh, operations team bedded in, uh, includes some new, um, new employees, some new members of staff working out in the freezing cold on the step. But so far, after a few teething problems, they're doing pretty well. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that. Uh, I'm very pleased, as I say, that they've gone from effectively a standing start to being fully operational in the way that they have. Uh, so we will enjoy that through the winter months. Obviously, we've got quite a bit still to work on. We've got that um, um, monitoring of Heron 1 to work out what surface modifications we could make to allow us to increase the production rate what we can do with the gas, uh, if that continues to be um, uh, as uh, voluminous as it is now. Work out what to do with Heron 2. Are we actually seeing the reservoir response or are we not? And on our exploration well that I didn't mention the results of, Gobi Bear 1 was a bit of a teaser. Um, it, it's got a log response that suggests hydrocarbons that we can't make go away, no matter 
um, what numbers we use based on data from the from the from the basin. Uh, but we had very very weak oil shows, so we're doing some geochemical analysis on those at the moment, and that will lead uh, to a decision on on Gobi Bear also during the winter months, so that once the um, operators um, return to Mongolia in the spring, then we'll be able to move ahead. And on the um, uh, renewable sector, we're keen to uh, basically take advantage of the momentum that has come with the new government and see how many projects we can get into our portfolio. So it's going to be quite a busy time. And we're very, very hopeful that during that time, the company's revenue stream from at least Heron 1 production will start um, because that has been a long time coming, too long, in fact. Many thanks. And as you said, a very busy schedule ahead. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us. Mike Buck, Chief Executive of Petromedan. Thank you very much indeed.